the English Manifesto. There we go. Um, to make uh, to get Labour to publish an English Manifesto alongside the the Scottish Welsh um, the Scottish and Welsh Manifestos that we publish at general election. Um, so please do feel free to take um, leaflet for that. All the other available information is on our website. Um, so we just um, want to say thank you again to all of our speakers. Um, Kim, if you'd like to come up, you'd be very welcome. Um, where do you want me? Is um, that here? Stood here? Where is that? Yeah, that looks all right, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Box and there. <laughs> Hello, everybody out there. Very nice to see you all. Thank you for joining us. I sadly don't have long as I've got a meeting to get to, but um, I did want to come and just offer a few thoughts and a few comments, I guess, to kick things off uh, and to get the discussion going. Um, but just to be really clear, I'm not here as any sort of expert in this subject at all. Um, my journey into politics has been very different to, I guess, anybody else's journey into politics. So I'm now the Member of Parliament for Batley and Spen up in West Yorkshire. But um, the reason that I've ended up with this job is because essentially my sister, Jo Cox, who was the MP of the same constituency, was murdered in June 2016. Um, and I had never set out for a, a career in politics. Um, I'd always been very politically interested, but not particularly active. And then when Jo got the job, I saw how she did it and I saw how politics is actually all about people. And as someone who is very much a people person and wants to help people, wants to make a difference to people's lives, um, I saw that politics is actually a really powerful way of doing that. Um, but Jo was murdered by a, a right wing extremist. And I think following her murder, which I have to be honest, I still can't believe happened on many levels. Um, I started to think about society and community in lots of different ways. Um, and a big part of that was about identity. And I think that is where my interest in the subject of Englishness kind of comes from. Um, and I think for me, we've got to understand that it's perfectly feasible and actually should be wholeheartedly encouraged to have multiple identities. And I'm really comfortable with that. I'm really comfortable being from Heckman Wife, which is my local town, um, and being a Heckman Dwight Grammar School girl, which was my local school. I'm really proud to be from Yorkshire. And we have a real strong sense of identity in Yorkshire. Uh, and it's amazing. I go to lots of events down here in Parliament, as well as in the constituency. And there'll always be a story about Yorkshire that someone's very keen to tell me and their connection with Yorkshire. So there's an identity there that I feel really passionately about. But I'm also very, very comfortable to talk about being English. I'm very comfortable to talk about being British. I'm very comfortable to talk about European, being European and indeed about a citizen of the world. So I wear all those different hats and different identities. Um, very comfortably indeed, as, as long with lots of other identities that, that I've got. Uh, but I do think there is something about this concept of Englishness, which has become a problem in recent years. Um, I was at a St George's Day event yesterday in my constituency, which was brilliant. And it was organised by West Yorkshire Scouts, of which I am the county president. Um, and we had loads of young people walking through the streets of Birkenshaw, one of the villages in my constituency, with a band playing and, you know, children from as young as probably four and five, right up to um, people in their 90s, celebrating St George's Day. And I think that's a really powerful feeling um, to coalesce around a day like that. Now, I have to be honest, I'm not entirely sure why most people were there. And I'm also not entirely sure if they knew why they were there. When it comes to St George and who he actually was and what he actually did, but I think what people loved was that sense of coming together and that sense of community. And I don't think we do enough around being English, which does that sort of stuff that brings people together and brings communities together. After Joe was killed, we did a lot of work around focusing on the things we have in common rather than the things that divide us. And that came from Joe's maiden speech in Parliament when she said <coughs> we've got more in common than that which divides us. And we've spent a lot of time doing that through the Joe Cox Foundation. And I've tried to bring that agenda into politics as well, because we spend a lot of time focusing on the things we disagree on, the things that we argue about, and not that much time thinking on the things that bring us together. But it's still perfectly possible to disagree. I think we can do that respectfully in a civilized manner on the things that we do, you know, not see the, the same viewpoint on. Um, for example, I play in the all-party parliamentary women's football team down here, and my background is in sport, and I think sport is a very good example of how, how we can bring people together through a common endeavour. So in the parliamentary women's football team, we've got some Conservative MPs, we've got some Labour MPs, we've got some SNP MPs, 
um, and we've got staffers who work in Parliament, we've got journalists who work in Parliament. So we come together through the power of sport. Um, and I think, you know, particularly with my SNP colleagues, we have a good chat about, you know, being Scottish. We have a good chat about being from Yorkshire and we have a good chat about our differences and our different identities. And I think that works really well and is really positive. But I guess we do it through that shared endeavour. And a lot of the stuff that we did um, through the Joe Cox Foundation was around that things that bring people together. And sport is a good example. Food is obviously another one. Culture, music, poetry, those things that bring people together. And finding our shared identities whilst also being able to embrace our own identities. And I think that's a really, I actually think it's really simple, but for some people and for society, we've made it much more complicated than I think than it has to be. Um, so my constituency of Batley and Spen is also a really good example where we've got people from all different backgrounds. So we've got, we've got a big Irish community, we've got a big Pakistani community, Indian community, Nigerian community. Um, and again, being proud of all those identities, but also being proud of being a resident of Batley and Spen, I think is perfectly feasible. I think we've got to be able to, to sell those uh, narratives uh, as not being mutually exclusive. But just going back to sport, probably to finish on, um, I get very upset that Englishness has been taken over, sadly, by some fairly unsavoury elements of the sporting community in terms of um, using St George's flag. We had football hooliganism not in the too dim and distant past. And I think they took the St George's flag and it became quite a, an unpleasant uh, narrative and symbol around um, bad behaviour in sport. And I think we've got a really important job to bring that back and fly the St George's flag proudly, fly the Union Jack proudly, um, and take it back from whether it's people behaving badly at sporting events or indeed more sinisterly, the far right. And I'm not afraid to do that. I'm not afraid to have those conversations about how proud I am to be English and how proud I am to be British. And I think we can do that while still respecting everybody else as well. You know, for me, and I said this during the, the by-election campaign um, that I was involved in, which ended up being pretty toxic, you can't pick your equalities. We have to treat everybody equally, but that doesn't mean we can't be proud of who we are and what our own identities are as well. So I think let's try and find a way of being proud to be English, but not that that means that we have to be horrible about anybody else, wherever they might be from, and being proud to wear different hats and have different multiple identities. Um, so like I say, I don't have the answers to this, but I do think it's really good that we're having this conversation, that we're having this discussion. Interestingly, a book came out today, I don't know if some of you saw this, Stuart McConaughey has just done a book today called The Full English, which I think looks like it could be worth a read. I think he's gone around the country having conversations with people about what it means to be English. You know, and, and he observes that, that, you know, Englishness is lots of different things to lots of different people. And that's not a bad thing. That's to be celebrated, surely. Um, so it's probably worth having a look at that book. Um, and I'm very happy to be involved in these conversations going forward. And for what it's worth, I'm happy to input, but I'm also very happy to listen and to learn. So thank you very much for your time, everybody, and have a good rest of the session. Thank you very much, Kim. That's been great. Thank you. Um, spotlight. Oh, that's a good point. Great. So, um, Polly, um, if, you, if you'd like to go next, I'm just going to put you on Spotlight. Here you go. On Spotlight, maybe. Um, great. Whenever you're ready, Polly. Thank you very much. Um, it's it's great to be here. And I, I feel very honoured to follow Kim, who um, is um, a great advocate for so many of the things that are important in this uh, conversation that she's outlined today. And it's it's uh, important that I think that we have those conversations about identity. But I'm actually going to talk more about the issues to do with how we turn those um, the feelings about identity and the importance of challenging some of the um, hostile and uh, divisive issues around identity into something that actually works and becomes a practical um, platform for change in uh, the Labour Party and in England, because John is right in his most recent Labour List article yesterday. England is just really, really, really badly run. And as a consequence of it being really badly run, run all the um, entrenched problems of England are becoming worse from inequality, um, uh, infrastructure failure, so forth. And I, I'll probably go on um, a little bit more about that. Um, and the reason why I think it's important 
that we have the conversation that Kim has articulated so well about the importance of identity not being something which divides people but brings people together is because Englishness has been quite often seen as an ethnic identity and we need to be able to create an inclusive Englishness which is basically a civic identity and one of the problems that we've had with the devolution deals that have been done uh, both at the beginning of the new Labour era and since is that you now have a civic identity of, Scot of Scottishness and you have a civic identity of Welshness but you don't have a civic identity of Englishness we are fractured, we are badly run, um, and that is that is creating greater inequality and greater division between people rather than bringing people together. So I think what the opportunity is for us to create a civic Englishness, which can then be part of answering the practical failures of the governance of England. And I think why that's important is because sometimes the Englishness conversation has been somewhere separate from our practical programme of making um, uh, the country a better place. It's like, oh, and, and yes, we need to tackle that Englishness problem. The fact is, an inclusive civic Englishness gives us the opportunity to start tackling some of those other issues. So the failures of the way that England has run has started to make the country synony synonymous with failure and mismanagement. The analysis of the problem, unfortunately, can sometimes draw people to constitutional change too quickly. I'm sure if the chat was open, there would be many people ready to leap in with an answer, but I think sometimes those constitutional changes can be an, uh, can be solutions in search of a problem. Uh, that is the problem, therefore my pre-existing solution will solve it, rather than looking at uh, building up a consensus about what that civic Englishness can do in order to be able to build consent for it. And I think there seems, needs to be some basic agreed ground. England needs to be uh, governed in a way that's more accountable, that's more transparent, that is more financially responsible and that is more empowering to, to um, citizens. And look at what is going wrong as a consequence of the fact that we don't have that now. We're, not only do we have greater inequality, as I mentioned before, we have fewer and more expensive houses. We have a cladding scandal. We have hollowed out seaside towns as well as former industrial areas. We have poisons, rivers and seas. We have under-resourced and badly designed services. We have crumbling infrastructure. We have short-term decisions that don't understand the local or how the local can add up to being more than the sum of its parts. So instead of uh, quite often problems are being solved by national fiat. There is a problem with with. Um, with housing, we shall send a national ha housing target. Rather than standards and a framework, which gives local uh, local communities more freedom to invest and to secure private investment and more accountability. It causes people in England to lose out on the benefits of having policies adapted to local areas and needs. Now, I will say this now before everybody starts going, oh yes, everywhere, everywhere is different. I spend most of my day job telling local authority leaders that much as they think that their place is unique, they have much to learn from each other. And actually what happens is that Whitehall and the civil service and, and ministers tend to divide local authorities and local communities against each other by insisting that they're all individual rather than, than giving an, a framework which enables them to aggregate and build up learnings between them. So that means that you fail to build expertise in policy design and delivery across the country as local government is hollowed out. Do not think that the only problem that local government has got is a lack of resources. It is also a lack of belief in their ability to be able to regenerate and renew their communities. So one area of a policy that requires significant design and delivery at local level with accountability and transparency is crucial for building public consent and support is the thing that I campaign on every day, which is climate change. Now, we have had hundreds of climate emergency declarations across the country by local authorities. We have therefore lots of local authorities making decisions to have a whole range of actions. And yet everyone is reinventing the wheel. We have a situation in England that's much worse than in Scotland and in Wales. And I'll go, come on to that in a moment. And, but what you have is D Luck um, and Michael Gove and so forth saying, oh, don't worry, you've got all the powers you need through the Localism Act. But there is a limit to those powers and the limit of those powers comes from national government. We don't have the same. You don't have the same problem in in the devolved administrations, partly because Wales, te Wales tends to be setting frameworks to enable local action, and the Scottish administration has centralising tendencies, 
but that which limits local government to do things more differently, but they have got an idea, a view of how to tackle climate change. However, my argument to that would be, as things get more difficult, you will not have built up the public consent and support you need locally in order to be able to do this stuff better, which is why we need to have a governance transformation in both England and Scotland, but I would particularly say in England because we've got the, the kind of mess that we're in. So national governance, civil service, treasury, regulatory bodies, actual policy frameworks, they are not creating the circumstances within which something as crucial as climate change can be successfully tackled locally. Now, I am pleased to see that uh, one of the commitments that Keir Starmer and the Front Bench have made is about the ta take back control bill actually involving climate change. But we have yet to see more detail on that. That has not been more, for, more fully elaborated. And I think it needs to be. Because English identity, going back to Kim's point, doesn't preclude enthusiasm for action on climate change. But the people who tend to identify as English can often be the target of some of the most hostile communications to stir them up, to resist transformation that is required in our communities in order to be able to reduce to uh, tackle climate change it taps into a set of values like freedom and autonomy that are quite often associated with englishness and where and the example i will give you is the anti-low traffic neighborhoods um campaigns that you will have seen now some of you may have seen it uh, featured on the television the other day about oxford but it's also happened in places like thetford and glastonbury none of those have got the kind of strong big city identity that has benefited from the Devo deals from this government. Instead, you've basically got district councils or two tier authorities trying to do the right thing and being in, uh, and being embattled because um, English identity is being harnessed and those values are being harnessed to, to challenge some of our other progressive values. So I would say there needs to be an English dimension to that take back control bill, which obliges, permits and permits climate action at the appropriate level of local government, introducing proper accountability and transparency on the energy industry, on town and infrastructure planning, on all other utilities and privatised utilities, on transport and on waste. Unless we do that, we will find a way that, that um, our English identity challenge separate from our programme of a progressive future for our country. And that would be a great mistake for us to, uh, to commit. Great, thank you very much for that, Polly. I'm just gonna move the screen backwards for here. Apologies to anyone with any sound issues in this room. Um, it was the other way around last time. Um, if it's not one, it's the other. But I think hopefully, um, I'm just going to do a test. We're just gonna do a quick test on this end. Um, Polly, if you wouldn't mind, um if just saying hello um, just hello uh, Can you... right, yeah. well, all right we know for next time that works a lot better now thank you um, just, that, for us in here it's, i think it's all fine online it's just in this room um uh, but no that's great hopefully that microphone works uh, fine as well um up next we have john um so thank you very much again polly thank you polly and thank you kim um and uh oh, sorry. Sorry. Where should I stand? Where should just, I stand? Okay, fine. Thank you, Polly, and thank you, Kim. And I hope to pick up a little bit on bits of both what Kim said and on what Polly said. Kim talking about shared identities and multiple identities, and Polly linking that directly to the question of governance. And interestingly enough, actually, the first time I met Kim a few months ago at a dinner, and she was actually complaining about how nothing in Batley and Spen was joined up. So mental health services didn't join with police services, didn't join with education and whatever. And I made the point that the reason it's like that in Batley and Spen is that it's like that in Whitehall. But there's actually no machinery of government for England that joins things up at the centre, so it's not surprising that things don't join up uh, locally. But anyway, I wanted to talk a bit more about one of the questions that was circulated for the evening, which was the changing nature of identity over the last 20 years, and particularly why it's important for Labour to think about English identity electorally as much as anything else. Because one of the big changes over the last 20 years has been the political salience of identities um, and not always in our favour. It's true to say that, that to some extent, the people who said I'm more English than British were always a bit more to the right than people who said 
I'm more British than English or equally English than British. But even so, back in the days of the Labour government, we used to want win amongst all three identity groups. Over the 20 years that followed, identities became increasingly polarised. The, the state where people who were more English than British were the absolutely decisive voters in the Leave vote in the Brexit referendum. And in 2019, 70% of people who said they were more English than British voted for Boris Johnson and the, and the Get Brexit Done election, which gave us the Conservative government that we still have today. Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party actually won or beat the Tories amongst the people who said they were more British than English. Such was the state of polarisation. Now, before you respond to that saying, well, therefore, the English are clearly a bunch of reactionaries and we don't want anything to do with them. Uh, First thing we need to recognise that many of those people were Labour voters and have voted Labour in the past. And that identities do also change and we need to understand what happened over the last 20 years because uh, identities are not fixed, we can shape them. Now the voters that I'm talking about are yes, more socially conservative than others. But if you look at the people who say they're more English than British, they are to the left now on immigration of where the more British were 20 years ago. So everybody, if you like, has become more liberal on immigration. Some people are moving slowly than, uh, behind, but they're moving in the same direction. Only a small minority of people would now say you have to be white to be English. That would have been very different uh, 20 years ago. These voters are generally to the left of center on their economic values. They think that the economy is unfair, that it rewards the wrong people. They want strong public services. They want the state to be involved in reshaping the economy. And to some extent, their Englishness reflects the experience of who they are and what their lives have been like. They tend to be older. That doesn't mean everybody who's old is English, not British, or everybody who's young is British, not English, but they tend on average to be older. If the more British are more diverse than the population as a whole, the English groups are somewhat less diverse than the population as a whole. They tend in larger numbers to live outside the bigger city centres and outside the university towns. They're often in places that have been on the losing end of economic and social change over the last 30 or 40 years. They lack agency. They are much less likely to think that MPs stand up for people like them than other people in the population. Not that many people, I would say, hate citizens. Why do all think that MPs are really good at standing up for people like them? But they're even less likely to think they stand up for people like them. They have a strong sense of national democracy. This is where the majority support lies for the idea that English MPs should make English laws, for example. So if you look at that, if you look at who people are, where they're from, how they feel about politics, what their experience of life has been, over the last few decades, what we do need to understand about how the way that they have voted is that there's an element of that which is a very strong democratic aspiration to be heard. You've not been listening to people like us. And of course, it has been the right, it has been the, the Brexiteers, it has been the Boris Johnson Conservatives who have most successfully mobilized that feeling of not being heard. That's not to say the right in any way is delivering what people wanted. You only have to look at the fiasco of levelling up to see that there's no substance behind the rhetoric, that Brexit has not led to a revival of manufacturing industry or a stronger nation in the way that people heard, but that's what they were able to exploit. And to a considerable extent, that's the left's fault because the left has allowed that argument to be made unchallenged because it's not addressed the question of people of England and of Englishness and their sense of dissatisfaction. And that is absolutely still what the right wants to do. That's why they pursue culture wars. That's why they emphasize issues about ECHR, which are not really issues about rights or immigration, but are about trying to get a sense of resentment of uh, things that are going uh, wrong. The new National Conservative project, you will have read about the new National Conservatism project, is also about enabling a hedge fund funded right wing to put a protective arm around people who feel insecure and not listened to and say, don't worry, we'll look after you. Well, our challenge 
is to counter that by actually telling a story of England that is about creating a society that really would deliver democracy, that can deliver decent services and can deliver a fair economy. So the challenge is for us to tell a story to English voters that actually includes them. And part of that is to actually learn to talk about England, to talk about being proud of being English, as well as being British, not instead of being British, but as well as being British. And it needs to be more than that. We need to offer a progressive story of England. Uh, we've talked about the contestation around the St George's flag in the past, although that is one that is much less relevant and pernicious than it was uh, 20 years ago. We have to engage with that English sense of disempowerment uh, that really can rebuild our, our economy and public services. And the reason that we need to do this is that unless we talk about England, unless we talk about Englishness, we again leave the field free to those who want to exploit people's fears and people's alienation uh, for malign purposes. And the second thing about it is that talking about a shared English identity gives us the opportunity to bring back into our politics, not identity politics, but a sense of a shared nation one that belongs to all of us, the sort of class politics which used to lie at the heart of our labor, of our labor politics. So the electoral challenge to us is huge. And I think the Labour Party, though we've made gains amongst all groups of voters in recent, in the last couple of years, has not yet done enough to win back disproportionately those English voters that we have lost in the past. And that is actually the challenge to us at the moment. And it's important for the next general election because it's fine building up votes amongst people who are already progressive and are more British than English, who are living in places with Labour MPs at the moment. The people we actually need to win back are disproportionately in the seats that Labour needs to win when the next election comes. So thanks. Great, thank you very much for that, John. Um, but finally, we have Tarek Madud from the University of Bristol. Tarek. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and to say a few words on England and diversity. In 1992, I published a short collection of essays entitled Not Easy Being British which I argued that ethnic minorities wanted to be British and to be accepted as British, but that there were obstacles. In short, Britain needed to think of itself as a multicultural country and act as a multicultural country, making the reforms and adaptations necessary. And I added that the biggest challenge for any minority and for Britain would be one minority that wasn't white and wasn't Christian, principally Muslims. That was 1992. I think what I asked for, what I pleaded for, has actually in many ways happened. It's been largely surprisingly successful. I say surprisingly because it was contrary to what of the left as well as the right were predicting in the 1980s. But it is a British that folds in English identity for three reasons. Firstly, of course, is as we all know, loads of people confuse British and English. You know, there's a, there's a conflation. We sometimes don't know whether we're talking about British or English. Secondly, I think that there was, certainly used to be, certainly when I was, uh, you know, a young, young man, going back to the period of the book and so on, a kind of nervousness about an esoteric Englishness. Oh, I don't know. So Gerard Manley Hopkins and Delius Elgar and Vaughan Williams, old Anglo-Saxon churches in remote villages. A nervousness about an introspective, historical sensibility. And that leads to the third, third reason, which was a worry about racism, that perhaps people who thought of themselves as English 
were more nostalgic and slow to adapt than people who thought of themselves as Scottish or Welsh or Irish, or of course, primarily British. Because those kinds of national identities, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, British, are more likely to assume an anti-racist posture than people who said, proclaimed that they were English were likely to at that point, or perhaps now, and this relates to what John's just been saying. And then perhaps I'd, I'd throw in a fourth point, which is at least personal to me, that there is a kind of inertia or a cons conservation. Having struggled to be British, and of course, someone like me has been a struggle to be British, it hasn't come on a plate, it hasn't been given. You kind of want to hold on to what you've achieved through struggle rather than say, oh, well, let's forget about that. Now I'm going to struggle to be English or it's somehow more important to be English than British. Though, of course, all the three talks we've heard so far have made it very clear that we're not talking about an either or. So what, what about diversity in England today? Well, firstly, there is much more diversity in England than the rest of the UK. And it's linked to the idea of English nationalism, um, racism, because it means that the topic, the struggle for multicultural inclusion uh, and equality has a much higher salience in debates in England than it has in Wales or Scotland or, or Northern Ireland, of course. Um, some of this, of course, has been given a new force of life in the last few years by the anti-racism strongly uh, associated with and motivated by the Black Lives Matter uh, inspired activism. Um, and then, well, that in itself can cause a certain amount of uh, ambiguity about diversity because that movement puts a certain premium for understandable reasons about making black more central to British stroke uh, English. And that is not the same, of course, as diversity. Let me, let me give you an example, an example which I both admire, and as you'll see, I think illustrates the ambiguity I'm referring to. Gareth Southgate, said a couple of years ago that he was very proud to have created and led a national football team, an English football team that was diverse and reflected modern England. Well, of course it didn't. It was basically a biracial team, the whole squad, black and white. So that's what I mean when I say there is an ambiguity about what we mean by diversity. It can't just mean the inclusion of uh, black and white people. So I've already then referred to two conflations, two ambiguities, one between British and English and one between, you know, black and diversity. So there is a lot more work to be done on inclusive and exclusion, exclusionary symbols of national identity. And while English national identity is in some ways behind in this relative to British identity, I think most of the forward movement comes from questioning and making, comes from the questioning and making of British uh, national identity. You know, we've, we've seen this, uh, of course, in a certain kind of way, about where we are now with our cabinet and our prime minister, obviously a, a new kind of diversity that England stroke Britain has managed to uh, achieve almost um, without planning uh, an accidental diversity at the very top. The coronation in a few days time, in a week's time will be a good test of where we are with diversity and with being a multi-faith country as King Charles has always said, well, for decades has said that he wants to be a king of a multi-faith country. He even said 
maybe the title defender of faith would be better than the title the Pope gave, gave to Henry VIII, or which was defender of the faith. So I'd like to think that Englishness will follow in this train, in this train that I'm talking about, about Britishness and diversity. Some may think making in, this is making Englishness second fiddle in this way is not in the spirit of an event to celebrate St. George's Day, in which case I need to re-emphasize an uh, important point that I think I'm making. Within Britain, it is the acceptance of diversity in England. And that is where the large scale diversity is, as I said, that is especially responsible the diversity making in England, multicultural making in England, that is especially responsible for the kind of and extent to which multiculturalism has developed in Britain and become a feature of Britishness, as I think it has. That contribution of England to multicultural Britishness is certainly worth celebrating at an event to mark St. George's Day. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. Thank you, Harry. Uh, we want to, to now move on to a question. So if anyone online as well has got any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, can I try and make them obviously quite as broad as you can or as broad as you'd like as well? Just anything obviously on this topic. Just a reminder of our questions today that we've been discussing about how has English identity changed since the late 90s? Um, how can Labour in particular support the development of an inclusive Englishness similar to how it does with Britain? Um, what, what does it mean to be English? Is, Quite the question. Um, how can a Labour be better represent um, English identifying voters? Um, so great. If um, great, um, Vince, Vince. Oh, great. We've got one from Vince. So what I'm going to do? I'm just going to unmute. Here we go. And here we go. Oh no, Vince is already on. Vince, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. Thank you very much, and apologies for having to dip in and out. Uh, I've been running a. a, a uh, a dialogue session online because it's raining isn't that a very English thing to happen the day after St George's Day um really good we're having this conversation uh for those who don't know me I'm Vince Maple I'm leader of the Labour and Cooperative Group on Medway Council uh home of uh, one of at one point one of the few uh UKIP MPs and also uh a famous and infamous scene from Rochester tweet during that very by-election with vans and St George's flags. Um, two quick points from me, really. Firstly, is around um, symbolism. Symbolism is important. So we've got an all-out election here in Medway. If you want to come and door knock between now and next Thursday, you'd be welcomed. We very proactively took the stance. We've got an electronic billboard, which for 26 of the 28 days will say, choose change, choose labor. On May the 4th, it will say vote Labour today. The only other day we've put something else on there was yesterday. And it said, happy St George's Day from Medway Labour. Uh, we've shared that on social media posts uh, and Facebook groups, in particular community Facebook groups, hundreds and hundreds of likes. Uh, so it shows actually, uh, I, I suspect, and I'm very pleased that we did that. Uh, there was actually strong consensus that we did that as well um within the labor team locally i'm not sure that would have always been the case either locally or regionally to put something as clear about that up as we did so i'm pleased we did that um, so just to say actually i think we are moving to the right place but there's more to do secondly for me uh i think this is around politics we are the labor english labor network uh, and actually uh, one of the things certainly post may the 4th uh, hopefully with the Labour administration here and lots of other places across the southeast and the rest of the country, but particularly the southeast, if we think about where some of the UKIP issues were uh, identified going back 10 years ago now. Actually, it's the, the take back control bill as it is at the moment. I think the party should be shouting a lot more about this because actually this, this does a number, this one vehicle does a number of things. Firstly, it says actually, we, we understand why some people may have voted the way they did in 2016, and even perhaps now regret that in some senses, because perhaps they were sold not what they've now received. 
but but actually we know from conversations and, and John has done amazing work over the last forever on this. Uh, this is around, um, you know, positive identity. And I think people, when you talk about devolution, I, I think, um, I think we're at a point now where actually people, people, even people who aren't that interested in politics are at a point of maturity to say, actually, we want to get on with this. Give us the local powers so we can get on. They look at uh, Sadiq here particularly because we're 35 miles from London. Certainly communities uh, across the north look at people like Tracy uh, in Leeds and Yorkshire. Uh, there are other bits of Yorkshire that aren't just Leeds, obviously. Um, Kim would tell me that. Uh, and obviously Andy and um, Steve Rotherham in the, the North West and go, actually, these are politicians directly elected, talking to the residents, getting on with doing stuff, making a difference. So I think actually if, if that becomes law and actually that becomes meaningful law, that almost might kill off the desire from some quarters for the English Parliament argument, because actually we say we're getting on, we've got the powers to do stuff which is meaningful without perhaps the, the kind of centralised bit, whatever that might look like. Because again, the views of people in the Northwest and the Southeast may be quite different on some issues, um, but very similar on others. And actually that's where that bit of legislation, I hope will be first hundred days sort of stuff when it comes to the next Labour government. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for doing today. It's a really important conversation we must keep, keep continuing to have. Great, thank you very much for that, Vince. Um, Great, that's here we go. Um, great, anyone else with any questions, particularly in the room here? Yes, sir, if I can try and do what I can about the microphone, um, but it's not going to stretch that far. If you'd like to come over, yeah, feel free to come over. Let me just put the spotlight back down, perhaps. Um, okay, I've got one comment and one question. I come up, I'm, my name is Bryn Davis. Um, Incidentally, I happen to be Lord Davis of Brixton. Uh, apologies for being late at the meeting. Very interested in the topic and what's being discussed here. Uh, although my name is Bryn Davis, I've always lived in London. I would never describe myself as English, British typically, sometimes Welsh, particularly when there's a sporting event. But I also identify very strongly as a Londoner. And I just wondered, whether that's a dynamic that uh, it that will be particularly strong in London, but maybe I think that because I'm not that familiar with other parts of the of the country, there's Mary waiting to come in. Um, uh, so it, it's a uh, question. Identity. This idea of multiple identities is really crucial. The Question is, I don't like the mayor model of devolution much at all. Uh, in principle, I'm against it. But what is the structure of devolution that we're going to have? Do we need to pursue the mayor model? Because that's what's on offer, as opposed to some sort of more thoroughgoing form of devolution which was sort of set back decades by the experience with the proposal to have a Northern Assembly. So I just wonder what is the, what's the practical model of devolution that will give uh, structure to these ideas that I think we, we, we can all agree about, about identity. So I'm just going to hand over to Polly there. Um, I just want to spot that on you. And Polly, when you're ready. Thanks very much. Um, it's good to hear this, this conversation develop. Can I just respond to uh, Lord Davis's uh, suggestions on um, what structure? This is exactly what I'm warning about against. Please don't start with structures. Please make sure that we are building a narrative of what is wrong with England so that we can understand clearly that the problems with England aren't simply about something that could be dealt with by a constitutional fix, but that we are talking about a transformation of the way that England is run in order to be able to meet a recognised set of failings 
not just by this government, but by the way that England is run. And so I don't mind whether you're for or against the mayoral system, to be honest, or Davis. I think my, my observation about that is that the mayoral system has only been available at the moment to large conurbations. London's mayor is, is one with the most powers. And each one of those metro mayors has, dare I say it, and I'm not going to go into tedious detail, slightly different powers. Now, you may say that that is part of the consequence of my argument that you need to be able to build up consensus locally in order to be able to establish what needs to be done and to solve those problems. It may well be. But let me also point out that if we have a one size fits all form of governance for everyone, we, it probably won't work. And secondly, at the moment, we have a set of devolution deals which are ent almost entirely focused around big urban conurbations, strengthening the voice of those big urban con conurbations in a way that has been very good for them, you know, not only for the individuals concerned, but actually for those communities. And yet it has left behind communities like Vince's in Medway, which is at the other end of the same county, Kent, that I am seeking to represent in Thanet. Let me point out that Thanet is closer to France than it is to England, and yet it was the one with the first and only UKIP-run council. So let's not be unaware of the fact that we will need to develop structures built on consent and support, not with a, oh, you think you've got a constitutional problem or, you know, your drains are, are, are a problem, so therefore we're going to give you a mayor, but actually, this is what's wrong with England. It's not transparent enough. It's not accountable enough. The financial uh, systems are not fair enough. And we are not building something that is truly empowering for people. So can I please again emphasize, don't grasp for the constitutional war book and find a system or a structure that has previously been used or start a, a commissioning civil servants to dream up a new one should we get into power, use Vince's point about looking at that take back control bill and enabling us to be able to start talking now about what is fundamentally wrong with England so that we build a consent and support for that. Um, I know it is always a tendency of legislators and, and, and so forth to look for a constitutional solution to this problem. But actually, it is, as Kim pointed out, a cultural one. And from my perspective, and I think I, uh, I think John would agree, agree, an issue of the failures of running a country that we need to be fundamentally pulling together to create an argument for an English programme of transformation. Um. And would can I make a couple of comments? Yes, so Let's jump in. Questions. Um, are there any other questions or from our audience online? No, I can make a, a question and sure, uh, yes. Uh, Jamie, Jamie is clapping, uh, very, very, quite rightly. Um, yeah, just a few quick points on the take back control bill. I think that, um, Vince is right, and I would go further. The take back control, control bill, as I understand it, will be for England. It's not a bill that is going to revisit the constitutional settlement for Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland. We Labour needs to talk about it as a special thing for England. And it's not just because it is for England. In my view, whenever we're making policy for England, we should say it's for England, not say it's for Britain or the country, which doesn't say where we are. But secondly, amongst the voters we've been talking about this afternoon, English voters, they are the people most likely to think that devolution has not worked out well for England. They're the people most likely to feel that resentful about free prescription charges or social care or lower university fees or, or whatever. So actually, Labour saying we're going to do something to address England's problems is pretty key. The one thing that I would say about the Take Back Control Bill, because we're sitting here in Whitehall in this bit of the meeting, you could not find anybody within half a mile of here who could say that they are on the committee that is responsible for the government of England because England doesn't have a machinery of government. There's no civil service committee that looks across the piece at how English policy is implemented. And the effect of that, we've got to be honest, it means the Treasury runs everything. 
the UK Treasury runs everything. So you want to know why half the money that was meant to go for catch-up education for English children, not Scottish or Welsh children, but English children after the pandemic, is because stupid financial rules that were invented in the Treasury. And there's nowhere else that could have said that's not going to work in English schools. So that needs to be dealt with. But on the constitutional big picture thing, I broadly agree, it would inevitably be messy, the sort of devolution we're going to have. And on Bryn's, Bryn's point about London, I think a point to recognise is that identities, because identities are layered, it is very common, in fact, it's particularly common for people who say they're English to also have a very strong local identity with a city, a county or a region. I mean, I might not have tried this if Kim was still in the room, but the way I've always talked about it, if you say to somebody from Yorkshire, are you from England, are you English? Right, they may well say, Well, I'm from Yorkshire. Mm -hmm. If you say somebody from Yorkshire, does that mean you're not English? They'll say, No, of course I'm English. I've just told you I'm from Yorkshire. And the things are intertwined in that sort of way. So it is the case that London has one of the strongest regional identities as a city, um, other than the regions a long way away from London. But actually, if you look in, in London, English and British identities are strong here as they are in other parts, other parts of England. But yes, let's talk about our policy for, 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 for England uh, when we're making it. So that's enough for me. Um, and just add on, uh, Taraj, would you like to come in on this? Uh, no? Not really, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, do we have anything from, oh, Jamie. Hello, Jamie. So I'm just gonna spotlight you. And if you can unmute yourself. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. I'm just going to move ourselves here because we've got the division bell running. Just sort of, I think this has been, this sort of goes into the area of Holly, you suggested not to talk about this a bit, but like just sort of thinking of if there isn't a one size fits all for all areas and thinking as well about the fact that Cornwall just sort of rejected having uh, additional devolution deal. Um, how how do you sort of who gets to decide what area gets what in the future, and how do we get to a place where you sort of ensure that what people actually want within a particular local identity are getting um, the devolution that they want? And if there's not one size fits all how can you sort of how many different sizes are there going to be just sort of and who gets to decide that and is there going to be would, how would you go about deciding what sort of devolution looks like in the different areas without um imposing mayors but also sort of not having everything unique in different areas does that make sense Can I go quickly? One is, I, I think, Jamie, we should be much more relaxed about messy devolution. It's more important that Cornwall gets what Cornwall wants than that Cornwall has the same as Greater Manchester, because you don't really need automated commuter ticketing systems on the railways in Cornwall, because they don't really have enough railway lines to make sense. And I think it's a great shame for Cornwall that they've had to scale down their ambitions for devolution because the people of Cornwall said in the polling that they didn't want a mayor. I can't think of any reason why Cornwall needs to have a mayor to exercise those powers. And the bit of England that I come from, which is of Hampshire, the Isle of Wight, Southampton and Portsmouth, it's been the reluctance to agree a mayor is the only thing that's standing in the way of those local authorities coming together and forming a combined authority. Despite the different politics, it's not party politics, it's a lack of, so I, now we don't know what's gonna to happen to Gordon Brown's report, but Gordon Brown's report says that Labour shouldn't require mayors. That's the first part of it. The second thing is that, my other answer to your question is, I don't see why areas should not be able to draw down the powers they think they want from, if you like, a central menu. Subject, yes, of course, to you know, maybe having to demonstrate you've got the capacity to use them, proper accountability, all of that sort of stuff. But I think if we if we believe in subsidiarity, there doesn't need to be somebody sitting in Whitehall saying we're going to second guess everything you do, which is 
the nature of the devolution deals that we have at the moment. So that that's my view, but Vince or Polly may have a different view. Yeah, we're going to go to Polly first and then Vince. Yeah, I was just going to say, you just need to start with what problem you're trying to solve. I mean, the, a really good example that we've got in, in Thanet um, is the problem with Southern Water. Vince has also got the problem with Southern Water. It's slightly different because Thanet is surrounded on three sides by sea. So when the sewage starts getting dumped, we can't use any of our beaches, any of them, right, in a tourist place. So that is pretty fundamental. Now you can you can spend your time saying, "Oh, you've got to pass a bill in in uh, in in uh, Westminster in order to be able to stop all of the work with the water industry, the, all the whole water industry being terrible." Agreed, right? Something needs to be done about the water industry, but accountability and transparency for that privatized company is absolutely right for everybody who currently pays their water rates in that area. Now that's not the same as us having to fiddle about, fiddle faddle about in Kent about whether Medway and Thanet should or should not have powers over water because that would not be reasonable. Where is the problem? The problem is the lack of accountability of a monopoly which covers a vast range of so-called local government which doesn't have any power over holding those people to account. I've seen them try to in Thanet, and they did try man manfully to stand up for their residents, but they had no power to do something about that. So uh, the, the menu of uh, powers and subsidiarity that John is talking about is important, but always the strategic political question needs to be, what is the problem you are trying to solve and work from there to understand where power lies, where it should lie, how you make it more transparent and accountable and where the money goes, where the money comes from and where it goes to. Once you start posing those questions, um, rather than again, having a particular model, which is what is being, what is, has failed the in the situation in Cornwall, you start coming up with something that meets the needs of the place that you're talking about. And again, it goes back to my point. I speak to so many local government leaders. I try to reassure them that they might have a unique set of circumstances, but that their place is not actually as unique as they think. They have more to gain from aggregating and collaborating through, uh, in a form of devolution than they have by thinking that everybody's got to have something that's actually bespoke. So I think we need to understand what we have in common while we develop these devolution deals. Brilliant. Thank you, Polly. I'm now going to go to Vince. Um, here we are, Vince. Can you ready? That's really helpful. And I agree with everything that Polly said, mainly about how terrible Southern Water are, but actually the, the ability to try and hold them to account. So whether it's through district and uh, county council, unitary authority, they're slippery, as slippery as some of the stuff they put into the sea. So um, we need to, that's a great example of why we need uh, this uh, change in legislation. I, I agree with John as well. And I think jo John's um, uh, uh, contribution there around actually just highlighting, again, the different forms of local government we have already just, again, across um, the southeast of England, because it happens to be that John and I and Polly are all in the southeast of England. Uh, and actually that shows devolution has worked because those communities that have unitary authorities would have chosen that proactively. Um, and the, the fact that this government, which has talked about, um, you know, giving powers to communities, but only if you have the form of governance that we choose for you, that's fundamentally flawed. So I have, I have more confidence than I've ever had. And you can all remind me of this when we have a Labour government and none of it's actually happening. I hope that doesn't happen. But you know, with the with the Brown Commission, and if you haven't read that, I'd urge everybody to read that. If you're on this call, you definitely should read that document. It's got um, a plethora of things we should be doing, including giving communities powers um, uh, without the requirement to have whatever we say from the centre as their form of governance. Uh, and actually, in Lisa and Andy, I think we've got a, a Secretary of State in waiting that gets it. You know, when she's talked about, and we've all heard her say, I'm sure the Hunger Games approach to funding, uh, actually that's right, we've got to end that. Uh, and we end that in part by putting forward these, these uh, options, the menu, I think that's the way to put it. So going back to Jamie's point, it will be for Medway's democratically elected 
um, leadership locally to say, actually, we fancy running transport, we fancy running skills, we, we don't think health is for us. But actually, if we talk with uh, Sussex and Kent and Brighton, then we might want to run it together collectively. And then for me, I, we'll see where the legislation finally ends up. I think the ability for, and I agree with John's point, most of the time, party political rosettes won't come into this because actually people in local government care about local government. We have, di we have differentials of views as to how we get there, but there is a fundamental, you know, the LGA is successful because actually, again, to use that phrase you've heard a couple of times tonight, we do have more in common uh, about trying to get resources to the place that we call our community, albeit that we may have some different priorities when we get there. So, so that's what I hope to see as a kind of nuts and bolts to that. Um, and there won't be unlimited cash. You know, that's that's we need to recognise that however much we want the Labour government of hopefully next autumn, when Polly gets elected and boots out terrible Craig McKinley, um, that we end up with uh, we, a realisation that we're dealing with, not least because of last uh, autumn, a huge economic problem made of by the Tories. And we should remind them of that. You know, they've left us no money. Uh, and and we, we will need to work through that. But again, empowering communities to come up with their own growth plan. What works in Medway won't work in Southampton necessarily. Um, so actually, and giving giving those communities the power to get on with all of that, I think has got to be a good thing. Thank you, Vince. Um, so I'm just checking, is there anyone else um, who'd like to ask a question, make a contribution online? Anyone? No? Take a look. No, I don't think so. Um, so um, in terms of our speakers here, actually anyone here, um, does anyone want to come in? No, okay. Well, yeah. I've had plenty to say, so I won't say any more. Terry, could we do it? Um, well, I don't really have any expertise about the nuts and bolts of governance, especially kind of local, um, um, county level, uh, regional, and so on. Um, so uh, it's interesting for me to have heard what you've been saying, the, the importance of a, to use a phrase that's usually used in it, has been used in a different context, kind of a variable geometry of devolution across, across England. Um, I, I too would support that, uh, that idea rather than either seeking a single template, you know, um, one style, one format fits all, or, um, you know, this idea that it's got to be a mayor which uh, several of you have uh, effectively discredited. And you might like to know if you're not aware, so I come from Bristol, most of you who've been talking uh, in a very practical and purposive way, a more southeast. So I come from the southwest, and we voted on quite a low turnout. We voted some years ago to have a mayor, and then there was a lot of dissatisfaction. It was a, a Labour mayor, and there was a lot of dissatisfaction, not least from Labour councillors, because they felt that this over centralised. Um, governance in the city of Bristol, because there was a small cabinet, obviously self uh, selected by uh, the mayor, and um, that they didn't understand why why they were elected, because there was nothing for them to do, but to endorse whatever the mayor and the cabinet did, and so there was actually a rebellion from within the um, aspect of the Labour Party, especially the councillors. And so we had a second referendum and we decided, again, on a fairly low turnout, but we decided we no longer wanted a mayor. So, so we've had mayor for two or three terms and now that's come to an end or in the process of coming to an end. Um, we do have other uh, tiers of government, you know, Avon and, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of large uh, local authorities and so on. And, you know, but so this isn't really answering any specific question about what would be a good way of devolving, but affirming or agreeing with you 
that it shouldn't be uh, one pattern fits all. And the experience of Bristol, where we tried something <clears throat> and didn't like it because instead of bringing power down, it was felt that it actually concentrated it in the hands of even fewer people. Mm. It's interesting. So um, just ask again from our audience at home, anyone that would like to come in? We've got online members there. No? Well, um, I think then we should be able to wrap up um unless anyone wants to add any final remarks here no, no? very good Brilliant. thank you thank um you. so thank you to all our speakers uh thank you everyone online for joining us um thank you councillor Polly billington thank you for <laughs> councillor vince maple from jo for joining us uh from medway i think my local labor group is joining you guys soon this sunday actually so <laughs> <laughs> looking forward to that um and thank you to lord um if i would just uh ask your name again sorry Davis. Lord Brenda, Davis from Brenda, Brenda Davis. Brenda Davis from Brixton. Yes, it's Brixton. Uh, thanks so much for coming along and giving your contribution as well. So, um, thank you everyone at home too. So, I think that wraps it up. Um, one thing we'd love you all to do is follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, um, on Facebook as well, basically on social media, so you can stay up to date with some of our events. And we also have an event right mailing, and we have our um. English Labour website as well. So if you'd like to be on mailing lists and if you'd like regular updates on some of our work, please uh, subscribe to those um, so we can get more of you engaged from across the country. So thank you, everyone. And I think we can wrap up now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.